Welcome to Whale Fest Monterey 2017. This is our seventh iteration of Whale Fest in this particular cycle. And we're so happy. Uh, we're expecting uh, over 10,000 people just today. It's another beautiful day in the neighborhood. So, and thank you for coming in here with all that glorious sunshine out there. If you are going to spend some time at Whale Fest, make sure you see some of the 40 different nonprofits that all have to do with marine science. We have a wonderful speaker for you today. Mark McLaughlin is the president of the Artichoke Research Association and of Clean Globe Inc., which is in Castroville. I'm going to, I'm, I was going to tell you what he's going to talk about, but I think you all know if you've looked at the screen. So, well, please, a warm welcome for Mark McLaughlin. <laughs> Well, thank you. Let me see if I can get this all to work here today. Um, driving in here, you probably noticed that there's a lot of farm land, a lot of agriculture along the highway and going over to the coast, right to the beach. So agriculture has been a part of the Monterey Bay area for 300 years. And what I want to do today is just present the interaction of agriculture and the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary. Uh -oh. Slide. How do you make the slides change? Right here? Okay. All right. <laughs> There's a cartoon about the farmer in the dell that I won't go into. But uh, anyhow, commercial agriculture started in the Monterey Bay area in uh, 1771 at the uh, mission, the Carmel Mission here. And uh, when the uh, Spanish started the mission, they gave them livestock. And they gave them 18 cows, they gave them sheep, pigs, and goats. Well, the 18 cows, looking at the terrain around here of grass, hills, valleys, and such, went, oh boy, oh boy, and uh, proliferated very well. Um, so the, they had quite a bit of cattle. And in fact, when the mission systems ended, there were about 300,000 cattle running around California. But they had no market for them. Agriculture with the mission was subsistence farming, they fed themselves at the mission. There was no commercial market for their products. Got it. Okay, so they had this cattle, and what were they going to do with them? The population was so small that they did not use them for meat, but they used them for the hides. So they uh, had the, the cow hide, the cattle hide, as sort of a basic tanning to it and to preserve it. And then uh, these individuals in Boston heard about this huge supply of cow hides. So they would send ships around Cape Horn, uh, going down the east coast of the Americas and coming up the west coast of the Americas. And the purpose was to pick up these cow hides. Uh, I don't know if you've read this book, it's one of my favorites. Uh, it's, it's amazing, Is uh, it tells a lot of the story of local history of Monterey. Um, but what Henry Dana, he signed on for two years, he was 1832-34, and came uh, around the horn and came up and they stopped in San Diego, loaded cow hides. They stopped at San Juan Capistrano at what's now called Dana Point, San Pedro, Santa Barbara, uh, Monterey, and then on up to uh, San Francisco is interesting, going from Monterey to Santa Barbara took two days. Santa Barbara to Monterey took two weeks because of the uphill run. They're going against the wind and the tide. And they had these square sail ships. So what they would do, they'd leave Santa Barbara 
and sail out 1,000 miles into the Pacific, halfway to the Sandwich Islands that are now uh, Hawaii, and then tack back. So they'll go 1,000 miles out, 1,000 miles back, and then come into Monterey. So this was the extent of commercial agriculture here in Monterey Bay. Uh, they did well. Uh, they had the large uh, Spanish land grant ranchos that the, uh, then the Mexican ranchos, very large, thousands of acres, and free range cattle. We, we didn't have uh, barbed wire then, the cattle just ran. Then this happened. Uh, 1848, they discovered gold. Uh, California became a state. Uh, population increase. So the folks in Monterey said, how can they prosper, you know, uh, profit out of this? So they were reading that apples were selling for $5 each in San Francisco to the gold miners. So what they did here, they grew potatoes because they didn't have much labor, and then they could get the potatoes up to San Francisco and sell them. Unfortunately, these ships were carrying miners, but down in the holds, they had a lot of storage, so they started carrying uh, food commodities. They'd sell it on commission off the East Coast, bring it over here and sell it. So eventually what happened, there was a, actually a surplus of food in San Francisco because everyone was going up the hills, and it was spoiling in the streets, so the market kind of collapsed. But so they went back to the cowhides, and that was working out well for them. And uh, yeah, here's one thing. I, I've never seen a gold mine on the beach. I think this was maybe an incorrect uh, <laughs> image of what, what was going on there. But anyhow, <laughs> so up till 1862, things went back to what they were. But this being California, things change. Flood. 1862 had a horrific flood. And this is Sacramento and the, the capital flooded. And what they had to do, they raised these buildings up nine feet and then uh, put fill underneath. So they raised the entire town of Sacramento. If you go there now and you see old houses, you'll notice that down below it looks like a storage basement area and they built a house above. So 1862, horrific flood, a whole central valley underwater, giant lake. I like this chicken. <laughs> but um, being, being California, the more things change, the more they remain the same. So 1863, had a drought. And this was a horrific drought. It lasted three years. And what happened was the cattle starved. So the cattle were worthless. So the people holding the large old Spanish land grants that were turned into the Mexican land grants, the economics were, they had to sell. So they started selling their land. And the gold miners, some that did well, some that were okay, came down and started buying this land for farming. And uh, it's interesting, go to San Juan Batista uh, on the west side, there's a ranch called the Breen Ranch. And the Breen Ranch are the Donner Party people. And that's where they settled. So anyhow, these large land areas were broken up. Uh, they invented barbed wire. And so the cattle were enclosed. They weren't free ranging anymore. And agriculture changed. So they started growing wheat. So Salinas Valley, big wheat producer, they would be milled for flour. They also grew barley. The idea with the barley is for beer, but it was no good for beer. But it was very good for animal feed, and everything in California at the time ran off horsepower, uh, actual horsepower, horses. So uh, they did well with this. This What's interesting here, this is all dry farmed. So they would farm utilizing the seasonal rain. So they would plant in the fall, let it rain on the winter, then harvest early spring or early summer, or late spring or early summer. So that went for a while. Uh, they did okay with this, but then this fellow came along, Klaus Spreckels, German. He went to Hawaii and started growing sugarcane and did very well. Made a lot, a lot of money with sugarcane and sugar. So he came to California and he came to Aptos and set up his first farm and sugar processing 
facility in Aptos, then later moved to Capitola, then he moved to Watsonville, and then he moved to Spreckles, south of Salinas. What's interesting is the sugar beets, these are row crop vegetables. So they're grown, they're planted in a row, they're grown in a row, and the other interesting thing, these are irrigated. So they drilled wells. And they initially started using surface water, they'd use ponds, they'd try to pull out the Salinas River, but it, it wasn't, uh, it was unpredictable. They couldn't depend on that water source. So they learned how to drill, and they drilled wells and irrigated the land and grew sugar beets. Sugar beets did well up until World War I, and for some reason the world sugar market collapsed. So they had to come up with al alternative crops. And they found the Great Lakes variety of iceberg lettuce did very well here. So they started growing iceberg lettuce. Again, irrigated agriculture. They, these were uh, furrow irrigated. They would have gated pipes, flood, flood the ground, and grow uh, the crop. But uh, again, using wells. I keep bringing up wells because it's going to be a part of what happens here in the future. Strawberries. Uh, again, strawberries now are drip irrigated. These were furrow irrigated. Uh, I like this girl here, typical teenager, going, really? <laughs> I don't want to be here. <laughs> Anyhow, like I said, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And then, my favorite, since I'm the president of Artichoke, Research Association, the Elegant Thistle, the Artichoke. Uh, these were brought by the Swiss Italians to Daly City, and they brought the uh, crowns, the tissue culture, planted them, did well there, then moved to Pescadero, and then moved to uh, Monterey County. So with irrigation, they could uh, uh, utilize more, more of the ground around here. And so they, you know, as, as the valley filled in, they moved to the coast. So they are farming on the bench lands right at, right, on, right at the beach. Again, this is north of Santa Cruz. Uh, diversified crops, these are Brussels sprouts, artichokes, and strawberries being grown up there. Uh, but again, uh, diversification, but again, farming right to the beach. This is Coast Dairies. This is the new uh, National Monument. Uh, this, obviously, with the name, when they put the railroad in, uh, became dairy ground. So they, they would uh, raise dairy cattle and then uh, ship the milk north or south on the railroad. Uh, what's interesting here, I was talking about wells. There are no wells here. If you go down about 100 feet, you're going to hit soapstone, and uh, you can't penetrate it. So what they would do, the rain would come here on the, on the Santa Cruz Mountains, and they would dam uh, either in here or, or form ponds and then pull surface water all year round out of their irrigation ponds. And again, uh, great diversification of agriculture up there. Uh, it's... Uh, for growing, it's great. Uh, again, the interaction with the uh, sanctuary has been, uh, it's, 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 it's been good, but it's been a learning experience for us all. Okay, this is south by King City. This is uh, 50 miles from the coast. Again, row crop agriculture, irrigated agriculture. And the one thing you gotta remember here, we're 50 miles from the coast, but this agriculture also interacts with the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary because all things flow downhill. So this is where we are right here. If you listen to your mother, you'd be right here. But anyhow, uh, we have the Gavilan Mountains, Santa Lucia Mountains, and then here is the Salinas Valley. And this is where we just saw that land uh, the, the, those uh, sal salad mixed vegetables down here in King City. But it all comes this direction. 
So, farming here for several hundred years, things changed in 1992. Uh, they created the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Um, here's Salinas Valley, Pajaro Valley, here's the uh, North Coast, San Mateo Coast, Carmel Valley, all ag areas up against the sanctuary. And I, I go to a lot of conferences around the country, ag conferences, and they ask me, well, what is it like farming next to the sanctuary? And I said, well, it's kind of like farming next to Yosemite, but it's bigger. Because here's little Yosemite right here, and then here's 287 miles of the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary. So it's, it's much larger. Uh, but again, uh, we are up against... Uh, the, the, the sanctuary and we have to be cognizant of that in everything we do out in the field because here are the agencies that we get to interact with on a daily basis uh, these are the ones I could think of there's probably more but I, you know I talk to uh, farmers from uh, Iowa and they don't do much with NOAA but we do and uh, any waters tributaries or anything flowing towards the sanctuary is under control of these various agencies. So they go from federal to state to local. So they'll be county. But um, again, um, it, there's, there's a thing to be said that there's money to be made in a well-regulated industry and we are well-regulated and hopefully we can be sustainable economically in this environment. So back to the wells. <laughs> so obviously, um, when they started in 1872, uh, seawater intrusion was not an issue. But about 1944, west of Castorville, the East Sea of the irrigation water started increasing, meaning it was getting salty. And wondering why here's Castorville here. And they're drilling into the 180-foot aquifer, and the water every year was getting saltier and saltier. By 1974, it was, it was a critical issue. So looking for a solution, they did the obvious thing. They drilled deeper and got to the 400-foot aquifer. And again, uh, about 1985 or so, Salt was uh, contaminating that aquifer. So what, what it is, is just sucking the seawater in as they deplete the aquifer here. So the answer is, drill deeper. Well, this aquifer is 1,000 feet to 1,200 feet deep. And to access it, the well will cost you a million dollars. And then the, uh, the water comes up carbonated pressure so um, and it's very expensive to draw up so uh, it's being done there are there are some thousand foot wells but uh, obviously it's not the answer to the problem so what we've done and this is through the offices of the sanctuary uh, management programs and Monterey Regional Water Pollution Control Agency we created what's called the Castroville Seawater Intrusion Project. We call it CSIP. And what this is, this is tertiary treatment of wastewater. So we're taking wastewater, tertiary treating it, and irrigating crops with it. Um, this purple valve, that's a international symbol of recycled water. So if you go to Italy and you see one of those that means it's recycled water. So this was started in uh, as a solution for the seawater intrusion problems we're having. So what they've done they're using this recycled water and they've shut down all the wells west of Highway 1. So they're shut and they're using 100% recycled water to irrigate those crops. And right now, uh, we're irrigating 12,000 acres of ag land with this recycled water. It's the world's largest 
agriculture recycle water program in the world. So not France, not Israel, here, here in the Monterey Bay. And we take a lot of pride in that. <laughs> so what else can we do? And, and again, this project was with private industry, the ag industry, uh, the state, the federal, the sanctuary, everyone worked together on this. And it, it, it's, it's one thing that came out uh, very well. Here's the other thing we have. This is an inflatable dam. It's a rubber dam on the uh, Salinas River up behind uh, Marina. Right now, this dam is uh, uninflated. It's just flat. So the river is just flowing through this. So the river's coming this way. The steelhead trout are going that way. But late or early summer, the dam will be inflated, and it'll make a lake back here. Then that lake is utilized to recharge the groundwater. So again, uh, just creative thinking, cooperation with all the regulatory agencies, and we've come up with kind of a simple solution. Who we work with on all this is the Agriculture Water Quality Alliance, and this is part of the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary Group. These are all the uh, uh, watersheds. Obviously, Salinas is the big, big one. But look at the Potterill River. I mean, this is amazing amount of land, acres, that feed into the Potterill River all the way. Past, here's Piscinas all the way down here. Uh, so very large. Uh, Carmel River with all the wine growers there. Uh, and then uh, San Mateo. But uh, these two watersheds are, are huge. But we're working with this group, again, coming up with answers to the problems. Uh, you know, there, 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 there are more. But uh, it's been a very cooperative group, and uh, we're bringing results. And here's the stakeholders. I'm, uh, I'm on three of these groups, but these are the stakeholders involved in what we're doing here as far as, uh, one, the seawater intrusion, to uh, runoff from uh, ag land in into the uh, sanctuary. Uh, but again, uh, I'm on grower shippers, I'm farm bureau, I don't know, other things. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 interesting story though, I gave a success story with the seawater intrusion and working with governmental agencies. We've also had mixed results. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service, it's a federal group, came in and noticed on artichoke ranches along the, along the beach uh, that we had red foxes there. Red foxes are not native. They were brought to California back to the turn of the other century, and they were brought for people to go fox hunting. They'd let them go in there and chase them with horses and all that. So they, uh, they don't do that anymore, but the foxes stayed. And they proliferated. They, they, they were part of our, uh, our, our little environment out there on the ranches. The foxes, uh, but the Fish and Wildlife Service, the federal people said, well, you have snowy plovers out in the sand dunes. And the snowy plover is an endangered bird and nests in the sand. Um, that the foxes are a threat. So they came in, they killed all our foxes, which was sad. But in our artichoke fields, we have a little rodent called uh, vole. It's uh, Microtus californicus. Well, without the foxes, the vole just took off. I mean, we, we were having devastation out there because of all the uh, voles. So uh, one of our older Italian farmers, Joe McKelly, who's no longer with us, got the idea, house cats. So he brought all these house cats. I don't know where he got them but you got a lot of house cats, and you brought them out to the field <laughs> to eat the voles. Well, I think the key word in the name is house cat, because they were out in these cold, wet artichoke fields, and they could see the lights of Castroville. So they took off for town, and now we have this <laughs> huge population of feral cats in uh, Castroville. In fact, uh, my company spends quite a bit of money uh, neutering them every year. We, we take them in. But... 
anyhow, so some projects work, some do not. Okay, this is cute. <laughs> Deer and fawns. But think food safety. Okay, it's bad enough that we're having to deal with the governmental regulatory agency. Well, not bad enough. I mean, it's we do deal with them, but uh, private industry comes in, your, your uh, receivers, the, the Walmarts, the Costcos, the, the large chains, and they're very much concerned with food safety. So they would see something like this and their food safety manager would panic because deer do what they do out in the field like bears in the woods. And so what we've had to do is, no, we don't shoot the deer. <laughs> We've put up exclusionary fencing. So we'll have a deer fence around the ranch. It's like $10,000 a mile to put the fence up. So we're doing that to exclude the deer, keep them out of the fields. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but old technology, scarecrows, we're tying it in with new technology. We have these white Tyvek suits. So we've made these scarecrows that are Tyvek suits. So you drive along, it's like ghost along our fields, but there, there are scarecrows. And they're to scare away deer um, and then birds. So we, we have a huge problem with horn larks, uh, Canadian geese coming in the fields and pulling up the emerging plants. So again, uh, looks nice, but uh, we, we just can't do this anymore. And, and I said, all we're doing is excluding. We, 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 we put in a requisition with Fish and Game for a mountain lion out the dunes, but they <laughs> did not provide one. What we want to do, we want to exist here in with the sanctuary. We want to be a good neighbor. We want to be stewards of the land. You know, it's, it's where we live. It's where we work. And this locally grown, we want to provide locally grown produce to the people here. So we, we want to be able to be out there sustainably growing and be sustainably uh, economically also. But in the concept of local growing, you know, this, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a challenge to work here, but it's also a privilege. You know, I go out in my pickup truck every day at the mouth of the Salinas River and have lunch. And it's just amazing to sit out there. So uh, again, uh, we want to be a good neighbor. We want to be a good steward of the land. And uh, we hope we can continue to be so. And yeah, in conclusion, I'm just, this, uh, this is a lettuce carton label from probably 1948, 1950. This company's not in business anymore. But back then, you know, there, there's Fremont Peak, pretty pastoral scene, peregrine falcon. I hope that's a horned lark. <laughs> but um, growers have always uh, treasured where they farm, and, and this, this area here is, is part of that. And uh, we hope to continue to do so, and again, uh, in partnership with the uh, Marine Sanctuary. Okay, uh, I'm open to questions. Does anyone have any? Yes, young lady. Uh, it, it percolates down that one, that, that initial aquifer is pretty shallow. Um, I don't know if you remember, but uh, out on Beach Road, west of Watsonville, the uh, wells are only like 80 feet deep. So uh, those aquifers will recharge. Uh, Lexington Reservoir, um, there as you drive over 17, that's totally for recharging those aquifers there in the Santa Clara Valley. So they'll let it fill up now, and then uh, later in the summer they'll let it all out, and all that's for recharging those aquifers there in, in Santa Clara. Yes? Is the plan then to begin using those wells again? No, those wells will never be used again. They, they can't, if they started using them, the seawater would intrude once again. So no, they're, they're taken, the, all the apparatus is taken off and the shaft has been uh, sealed. They put concrete down in, so it, it's done. So no, those wells will never be used again. Yes, sir? You know, desalinization for agriculture is too expensive. I mean, it'll never work for agriculture here. It costs too much. For uh, residential, 
Um, you guys are already paying a lot, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I guess it depends on what the uh, economy can bear. But uh, uh, again, desalination, very expensive, very energy dependent. And then what do you do with all the salt? So you got salt that you got to dump somewhere. So there's the issues with it. But I think the expense is going to be the, the initial problem for everyone. It's, 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 it's just brutal. Yeah, we're, we're covered by uh, Central Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board, and we are monitored uh, uh, very extensively as far as pesticides entering the waters. So if they do, uh, we know about it. And we're, we're taking uh, mitigating steps, like uh, around fields that are next to a, a, a water area, we'll put a vegetative strip in, a buffer strip. The problem with vegetative strips, though, is one, land around here is $60,000, $70,000 an acre for farmland. Uh, then, two, you're planting a lawn. So in these last three or four years, you could have thousands of acres of lawn out here that you're going to water when we, don't, we didn't have any water. And then, three, food safety. All the little critters live in that vegetative strip and want to crawl out. So uh, again, uh, there's no simple solutions. But um, you know, definitely we are monitored very much as far as anything going into what we call sensitive aquatic sites. Yes? I'm I actually work for the sanctuary and coordinate the aqua program. And oh, awesome. Yeah, I really appreciated your um, talk about the evolution of agriculture. It was really interesting to hear how things have changed through time. And I'm wondering what you see down the road, you know, what kind of evolution change do you think might happen in the future? Well, what we're seeing nationwide is more local grown, and uh, that seems to be a, a, a big uh, issue. Uh, kind of hurts us a little that we're competing against the local grown, but I, I see that more and more, so maybe we're going to have to get dialed in here more on the local grown. Uh, labor? That's going to be a giant question mark. I mean, that, that, and that's nationwide. Uh, labor issues could be very tough. And then food safety. Uh, compliance on food safety is tough. I think around here we're going to stay with the specialized crops. So you're going to have the artichokes, the Brussels sprouts are getting to be a, a big item, high dollar crops. Um, and uh, pretty much that, that's where we'll go into the future. As far as any science coming down the pike, uh, boy. I, I don't know. Yes? It is. And uh, the sad thing about it is tertiary treated, we would like to recharge the aquifer. Right now that plant's running and it's all going out in the ocean. Uh, and, they, uh, uh, and the government won't allow us to do that. Now down in San Diego they do, but up here we cannot. So uh, we cannot recharge the aquifer with it, so it's kind of wasted during the winter. But um, no, it's, it's drinkable water. One thing we said during the drought, that as long as they're drinking beer in Salinas, so we were good for farming. <laughs> so we were, we were fine. But again, uh, it, 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 Incredible, successful project, and it's again, it's the biggest one in the world, and uh, you know, no one knows about it. <laughs> now you people. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yes, in the back. Yes, just wondering uh, about future technologies that there are any thought into things like uh, vertical growth. Uh, yeah, uh, again, uh, getting back kind of to the homegrown areas where in the wintertime uh, they're doing the vertical and in greenhouses. So, you know, in, in Nebraska or Minnesota they could have some local produce during the winter. Around here uh, it, it doesn't make much sense, but in those specialized areas, uh, definitely. So, um, what? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, again, uh, Specialized, very specialized. So that's 
herbs. Um, a big thing coming in here now is the uh, uh, the uh, marijuana. Um, in Santa Cruz County and Monterey County, there'll be no outdoor growing of marijuana for commercial purposes. It'll all have to be indoors in a greenhouse, which we in the ag community are kind of happy about. Um, I, th I think it makes more sense to be more controllable. But you can grow six plants in your backyard for, medic <laughs> for medicinal purposes. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Siri, you talked about marijuana. Um, what about the uh, hemp as a, I mean, as a uh, source of uh, industrial hemp? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, they've analyzed it for like making biodiesel, and there's other crops that make more uh, uh, biomass per acre. Uh, as far as hemp rope, they still have it in various uh, applications, but not, not a huge uh, market for it. So I don't think hemp's going to replace cotton. But uh, again, uh, uh, yeah, canola seed makes more biomass per acre for the, uh, the uh, biodiesel production, although the marijuana smells better. Uh, any other questions? Uh, no one asked me about GMO. We don't do GMO here. <laughs> uh, they do a little bit down by King City, and it's for uh, seed crop corn. But that's usually a, a question people ask. But we, we, we have none here. Okay. Thank well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we are going to take a short break. My name is Steve Elzey. I'm with KRML Radio. I really want to thank our sponsors, too. Uh, Pepsi, KSBW, KRML. Uh, the city of Monterey, is, is uh, in a big part, has made this possible and the taping. So uh, I want to thank them, and I want to thank you most of all. Without you, there would be no reason to have Whale Fest. Thanks for coming down and participating and making it happen. All right. Yeah.